Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, polar senses. What polar bears see and hear and smell. Presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Christina Disney. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Christina. Thank you so much, Rob. And very excited to to be here to present this one today. And yeah, we are going to jump into the senses, you know, we're going to hit the big three. And if there's time, we might dabble on on the other two. But I guess the first thing I wanted to start us off with today was actually thinking about our five senses, both for ourselves and and then how we understand them for um, not even just other species, but for other people. Our senses are a very personal thing. You know, we, we have all these measures that we use to compare, you know, the eye charts that you go to and the doctor or the hearing tests you have to take. Um, but the reality is that even from person to person, these things are, are so very, very unique, right? We can look at this screen and that little rainbow of colors that we see. There's a very good chance that, you know, most of us don't quite see the same green necessarily or, you know, we interpret it differently. But because we're all kind of sharing that information together, what I call green and you call green, we're now sharing as a collective thing, right? And so understanding senses is one of those things that, you know, it seems straightforward until you really start to dig into it. And so I hope you kind of keep that in mind as we do our very best over the next hour to understand how it is that a polar bear is going to be interpreting their world. And the first thing to think about with our senses is that there are means of interpretation, right? So we're looking for cues and signals about our environment and our interactions with it that in order to, to sort of just get through the day. Um, and humans who certainly live in a very diverse environment, um, we have lots of cues and stimulus that we take in, but so do polar bears, right? Uh, and theirs are arguably extreme in a much different way because they're also a semi-aquatic mammal, right? They're spending some of their time living, certainly, or spending most of their time on the water via the ice or in the water swimming, right? They're hunting a prey that is also semi-aquatic. They're, you know, their primary prey being seals that are going to haul it onto land. And so all of their senses have evolved to fit these uh, environments as best they can, right? It's all about uh, you know, interpreting their own species, but also sort of interpreting their environment and the other species they would come across. And so I couldn't help but think of this. Um, and I know that they make new commercials, but the old commercials with the polar bears drinking Coca-Cola uh, and, you know, sort of that question in the back of my mind of whether or not they would have any interest in that. Right. But that that, uh, you know, what what is to a polar bear's taste? Right. What is it that they would be most interested in. So we'll circle back to that in a little bit. But we're going to start first with, I think, the sense that humans really do uh, rely on the most. So it's the one that we're comparable the most, which is that humans, we're a very visual species. You know, one of our smallest organs takes in the most amount of information for us so that we can understand our world, interpret it, you know. Um, the classic line of, you know, 90 whatever percent of communication isn't verbal, it's body language, right? That's because we're visual. We, um, it's our strongest sense, the one that we rely on the most. And so for us then, I think this is a good jumping off point so that we can see how ours compares to others, how it compares to the polar bear's uh, sense of sight. But also what's true for them is not as true for us or vice versa. So what I mean by that is we're really visual. We are a tricolored species or trichromatic species. So that means we can see in three different tones. We can see in greens, reds, and blues. Um, and that comes down to the rods and cones in your eyes. So anyone who had to have glasses or different eye things over the years, some of this might be fresher. But basically, if you, if you go into an eye, if you go into a mammal's eye, at the back of the eye, we have two specialized types of cells that take in light, or they're called photoreceptors. One is rods and the other is the cones. Now, the rods are what we use actually more for about understanding movement. Um, and then cones are what we use for interpreting color. And so there's kind of three things to think about. And this is true for all mammals. So the first one is that in general, rods outnumber cones, right? So our, our ability to understand movement is ultimately more important than our ability to color differentiate in our lives. Two, 
is that the ratio of the rods and cones is, is proportional to the lifestyle of a species. So whether they're nocturnal, right? So whether they're day, nighttime or daytime species, that makes a really big difference. And then three, if we're talking about just the cones, that for mammals, we have two specialized types of cones and they decide what type of light we can see. And so there's a cool sort of evolutionary path um, that we're gonna walk through as to how it is that we got this way. We'll go start big with mammals. So this is a dyed picture of the back of an eye. And so this kind of gives you an idea of how those cells are distributed. When I was talking about rods and cones. So the rods are the ones that are dyed red and the cones are the ones here that are dyed green. And so this is pretty cool, right? So you can kind of start to understand how those are distributed for different animals. So the top right for us, right? So there's um, the ratio there, if we think about it, that's most likely representing a nocturnal species. They can have anywhere from about a one to 200 ratio. So that's like one cone for every 200 rods versus a diurnal species, which might be something maybe more like C um, down there, which they can have up to um, 200, or sorry, 20 cones for every rod because they're really trying to look at color more, right? So something, um, something that's maybe going after fruits, right, would be more interested in color because that would be a way to differentiate when they're looking up into a tree. Um, but what's sort of crazy about this is that, so I said that we have, we have two ways of thinking, or sorry, humans have three, but most mammals only actually work with two colors. They can only either see uh, in blues or reds. Uh, but if we actually roll back in evolution a little bit here, uh, I feel like I got cheated out because if we go back in evolution or if we look at uh, some reptiles and birds, they actually still have the ability to see in four different color spectrums. So they can see reds, greens, blues, and then they can actually still see things on the ultraviolet spectrum, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Because um, as a visual person, as a visual species, I can't even imagine what another color could look like, right? I can sort of imagine there are sounds that I haven't heard, there are smells I've never experienced. I can understand that, but color-wise, it, you know, as a visual species, you can't imagine a color you haven't seen yet, whether you've come across it, you know, personally or not, right? And so it's, it's this whole other way. It's a good thing to just remember that the way to see the, the ways you can see the world exist beyond what you can even imagine. Just the, the quick little dodge for that. All right, well, let's start making our way closer to what it is that a polar bear experiences. So I said that those cones that they have, they are so if, um, sort of primates. It's sort of old world primates and humans have all three cones. We have, uh, we have, sorry, we have S's and L's, and then we can kind of see in the middle there too with the M's. But if you are a polar bear, you only have S cones and L cones. And that essentially means that those, that shade in the middle is not as useful for you to be able to see. So if we think about that, then um, what the what light range, right? So light is all about the the size of the of the wave is determined the visible spectrum that we can see. And so uh, if I look at this graph here, right? So uh, ooh, I can do this phototopic. There we go, phototopic and scotopic. So scotopic means little light, or so it's sort of like their nighttime vision, and phototopic is their daytime vision. And so it just shows you what, what wavelength they're sensitive to. So you can see, we kind of use this and pair this up together, that when there's lots of light, so daytime, they're sensitive around 450 and then just under 550, right? Or five, yeah, around 550 there. So they're gonna be in that blue range, and then they're also, like greens but almost more into yellows right and then if we look at their nighttime vision and sort of scroll up with that their nighttime vision is again that lighter green and into the yellows so if you think about uh, specifically a polar bear right if you think about where they live in the arctic well relying on green is not really a super important thing is it because they're essentially surrounded by a world of white so you can see how that kind of would trail off or, or evolutionary wise, it's not a big loss to focus on those other spectrums. Now, if we compare a polar bear, let's say to us or say a human, right? So humans, you can see that we, you know, we have a really general broad spectrum of being able to see in light, right? We can kind of, we're generally good, we're, you know, generalists, we can see across it. When we look at that, the cat, however, for a different example, they're um, 
shifted more into sort of the reds, whereas the blue, whereas the, the lighter color is the polar bear. So at the end of the day, it's most likely that they can't see green or they can't see green as what we can see. So that's kind of their perception of color. Now, what about what they can actually sort of see, let's say distance wise or, or fitting other things? So a big thing with all animals, whenever you're thinking about how they understand the world or whether you're thinking about their predator or prey, even if you knew nothing about them, one thing you can look about is the orientation of their eyes, right? So an easy one is in fish, eyes that have, or fish that have eyes orientated up are most likely bottom feeders. Fish that have eyes pointing down are most likely uh, predators from above or forward can also be predators from above. So even if you somehow just stepped on earth today for the very first time, you've never been here before, just on that basis alone, when you look at a polar bear's eyes, they have frontward facing, actually quite small eyes, and the way that they're set is almost kind of like binoculars. So what that means is that they have a narrow field of vision, right? They'd have to turn their head quite a bit in order to see left and right, but they have really great depth, right? That's that focus that they're going for. And that's what they focus for because they're going for, right, they live in a very sparsely populated prey area, relatively speaking, so they have to travel long distances. So they're looking far and wide. And that's what their, their goal is. The other thing to keep in mind is that like other placenta mammals, um, they have what's called tapetum lucidum. So if you ever look at your cat or if you ever shine a light you know, on a bush in the dark and you can see your dog's eyes, right? That's because they're able to collect more light because they essentially are have a uh, reflective property in their eyes so that at nighttime they can bring more of that in. And so polar bears can see sort of like they're, I guess that's what I'm trying to get to here, is that polar bears live in a very interesting environment when it comes to are there, is it easier for them to see at night or is it easier for them to see in the daytime? And the answer is they do the best they can in both. Because if you are a polar bear, it means that you are most likely experiencing both polar day and polar night, right? So when you go to the extreme ends of our earth, or the South Pole or moving towards the North Pole, it means that you're eventually going to have days that have 24 hours of daylight, and then you're gonna have days of 24 hours of night. So evolutionarily, if you're a bear, it doesn't help you to get really good at seeing in the daytime or to get really good at seeing at night because you're gonna to have to spend an equal amount of time under both of those conditions. And so it's kept them at this kind of like, uh, sort of evenly leveled success for, for both of them. All right, now, this one is, uh, actually, this I had this in, if anyone hung out for uh, vitamin A a little while ago, this is one of my favorite paintings, so I doubled down and brought it into this one too. Um, okay, so we talked about color, we talked about night and day, now let's think about distance and what it is they're seeing through. So one thing I want to sort of clarify is that polar bears' eyes are like human eyes. They're designed for seeing in air, not in water. So just as like when you go underwater and you open your eyes, everything's a little blurry, it's because we have a circular iris, whereas marine mammals actually have a whole sphere that's able to take in the dimensions that they need to see in water. So polar bears are better at seeing through air. Now, how far can they actually see? Well, based off of um, sort of their pupil size and their depth perception that we've been able to see, they can roughly see about as far as a human can, which um, is on average about five kilometers, right? Uh, so the reason why I brought up this painting is because it's a it's an old painting from the 1800s and it was this explorer, uh, Julius von Baer, and it's about these explorers who are going hunting for a polar bear for supper. And the painting is titled Going Out for Dinner. And if your eyes have been scoping through the painting, you may have noticed that uh, the context is that the bear is sitting there waiting for them. And so the question is who's going out for dinner, the bear or the human, hard to say. So with that distance, right, how far can they see? I said that they can see sort of roughly about five kilometers or about two, yeah, a little over two, two miles. Um, and even with our eyes, this is a, this is something like, as I was researching this, I, you know, it's like, how far can people really see? Because I kind of wanted to, to dig into this a little bit more. And it's an interesting one, because even though over, you know, we're nearly at like about 100 years of some very in-depth eye research, understanding the absolute threshold of how far a human can see is still not really clear. And the reason why is because it has to do uh, mostly with the amount of light that you're receiving from your eye. So if you wanted to get technical, the farthest object that we can see with our eye is Andromeda's galaxy, which is 2 million light years away. 
right? Because there's still enough photons for our life, for our eyes to actually gather that, right? So it's all about what we can focus on. So it's kind of like, it's a bit about the shape of your eye, but it's also just how much light can you gather? Or think about, go back to thinking about your eyes like cameras, right? If you hold a camera still for a long enough time, then you do gather enough light to actually see things. So as long as you're not truly in absolute darkness, sight is really, again, it's a very personal thing and it's very dependent on what's happening. So it's a, uh, it's a pretty cool one that we take for granted, I think, uh, just how amazing it is, all the information that our eyes bring in for us. Now, the polar bear eye has a few more cool things about it that I am equally jealous of, let's say. One is that they have what's called a nicotating membrane. So what that means is they actually have a third eyelid. So you and I, we open and close our eyes and that's vertical, but polar bears actually, like a lot of birds, have a third membrane that goes across their eye. And this is believed to protect their eye for swimming in water. So it doesn't make it clear. It's not like, a, it's not like putting on goggles for them, but it's a protectant, right? Think about having to swim in salt water all the time. It definitely starts to irritate your eyes a bit. And there are some theories that this is actually one of the things that might help with snow blindness, but that's kind of um, sort of up in the air. Not all the researchers out there agree on this one. There's a few things that you think about it. So I hope no one has ever undergone snow blindness, but when I said that it's all about how much light our eyes can take in, well, our eyes can actually take up too much light. Um, those rods and cones at the back, you know, it's kind of like sitting at the back of a theater. If you have the light on too brightly, it can actually burn them out and really cause a lot of pain and potential long-term dampness all the way up to full-on blindness. And so an animal, like a polar bear, that has to survive in polar day, which means it has 24 hours of daylight for sometimes weeks to months, um, is kind of a big deal, right? So how are they actually able to survive this? Well, some folks think it has to do with the nicotinium membrane. Some folks think that actually there's a store, they build up extra vitamin C in their eyes, which is one of the things that can help absorb extra UV radiation. And then there's also, they think that there are seasonal changes to the thickness of their cornea, which can also potentially help with protecting their eye. So really, this one little organ on their whole body, right? We've had polar bears around for, yes, you know, polar bears as a species, really not all that long, right? They're sort of our youngest of all bear, and they're already, their bodies are adapting to these nuances and, and making it so that they can survive there, which is pretty crazy. And I'm not even done. There's actually, I saved my, arguably my favorite thing about their eye till the last. So, oops, there we go. So, the other thing, which is yet sort of not fully confirmed, but people are really starting to, to buy into, is that there are um, magnetoreceptors in their eyes. So what do I mean by that? Well, our Earth, because we have a nice big Earth with a nice big molten iron core, is basically a giant magnet. And even though us poor pitiful humans can't feel it anymore, we're starting to understand that there are so many animals that actually can feel the pull of the Earth's magnetism, animal magnetism at its best. Sorry, I couldn't resist. But what I mean by that is that there's distinctive sort of bands of, you know, if you think about your, your north-south on your magnet, there's actually the way that the particles are going to flow to it is distinct. And those are relatively constant through time. They do kind of change, but that's on the order of like thousands to millions of years as those things change. So for the order, for the lifespan of an animal, they have really consistent bands. And so it's almost like they're walking with their own little internal GPS. And what we're starting to learn is that those, the cells that we think are interpreting that magnetic symbol are actually found in the eye. So what they're called is they're called cryptochrome cells. And what happens is that what we're starting to understand, and this is a big thing of how we think that a lot of birds do migration, like you know, big migrating species, whales, birds, sea turtles, things like that, is that um, either in the brain or in the eye, they have these cryptochrome cells, and they're essentially a protein that reacts to energy coming in, either light or what we think now, the, magnet, the magnetic energy, um, and that's able to get translated to the brain and used as directional tracking, which is pretty freaking cool. Right, so if you want to talk about uh, you know being able to see your way forward or uh, the person you want to have with you on a on an adventure, uh, it's definitely someone who could tap into that. Sorry, my my brain went into fiction fantasy of how amazing that would be, but anyways, who knows? Who knows where the world will take us in a few hundreds or thousands of years? All right, so we've I hope we've tapped into a little bit of how a polar bear can see. 
Now we're going to shift over to what we think they can hear. Uh, this was on, I remember this was painted in my school where I grew up, where in my elementary school, listen and silent are spelled with the same letters. Think about it. Um, and so before I dive into the sounds of a polar bear, I just want to take a moment uh, or, or give you a moment, I should say, to think about what are the sounds that a polar bear could or would hear, right? If we really slow ourselves down for a second, if we put ourselves out on that Arctic sea ice, you know, it's November, on a good day, there's no wind, it's quiet, you'd be able to hear the crunch of the snow underneath your paws. Maybe it's not quiet. Maybe it's windy and blizzarding and it's been howling for days and all you can do is walk with your, you've got your back to the wind and you can hear the wind ripping across your fur and, or you hunker down, it's not even worth trying to walk anymore and you just let the snow build up around you until the storm passes and you stand up and shake it off. The sounds up there are very different, I think, than the sounds that we would experience here. Um, and, you know, I think we, we might think of it as, as empty or not diverse, but I think you just learn to hear, you know, same as everything. You learn to, to be there and, and to interpret different things. So, with that in mind, First, let's understand sound before we can start to understand the sounds that a polar bear would be listening for. So for us, the way to think about sound or the way that we kind of define it scientifically is we make the distinction between hertz or decibels. So when we're talking about hertz, we're talking about how high or low the pitch is. So whether you're way up here or way down there, right? And then decibels is gonna be how loud a sound is. Right, so that's how, how much did you turn the speaker up? The song is still the same, but is the speaker really, really quiet or is the speaker really, really loud, right? And so loudness, there's sort of a range, there's a bottom range that we can't hear and then there's kind of a top range that destroys our ears. And then hertz is kind of like, you know, like the dog whistle where there's a sound happening, but at least human ears, we can't hear it at all. So if we look at, take a zoom out and look at most mammals in general, there's actually a pretty big frequency or hertz range that we can tap into and actually be able to hear. So on the lower end, where you know, humans are around 85, sorry, around 20, uh, and we can make it up to somewhere around 20,000, which is a pretty big range. So if we think about polar bears then, in comparison to the frequency that they can hear, they check in somewhere low around, around where a dog can hear, and then they actually check in on the higher end somewhere just around where a dolphin, so you know those marine mammals that they would be interacting with, that they would be, the sounds that they would be making, which makes sense when we think about their prey. So a polar bear's primary prey is the ringed seal. There's about 2 million of them or so in the Arctic. They also feed on things like bearded seals. Some populations are able to go for walruses, things like that. And so if we think about the sounds that they're making, we just think about a ring seal first here. So there are kind of four distinct vocalizations. One is a low pitched bark, then they have high pitched yelps, and then they have growls, which can lower high pitch. And then they also have these sort of descending chirps that they do for calls um, when they're under the water, sort of hunting for themselves. And so, again, because we're a visual species and we can't, uh, it's, uh, you know, we can send sound clips to each other, but what you, those graphs on the left, you're actually looking at sort of a visualization of what those calls would look like. And then it's got the frequency of the hertz on the side. So most, um, most of these calls are under 2000, that's the kilohertz, so it's under 2000 hertz, which for a polar bear fits right into their sort of perfect hearing range, which for them, are they're able to, to tap into that. Um, whoops. And then, if we think about their behavioral responses, there's they've shown this like the different calls they've actually had recorded of seals and then polar bears like polar bears that were captured from the wild. They've played the calls back 
and the polar bears, their ears get erect, they lift up their heads, they start scanning the room, and they'll begin to sort of sniff around and uh, start to pace and sort of try and, right, because they're, they're cueing into the, to the predatory call there. So there's the, there's the hunting side of why sound would be important, um, but sound is also really important within their own species. So one thing that a whole bunch of research has gone into of late is about how anthropogenic sounds in the Arctic can be affecting polar bears, specifically maternal dens, right? So this is a time where mama bear is most sensitive, where her cubs are most vulnerable. And so they are really trying to pick really safe denning sites that they feel secure in. And the sounds that, um, that they're getting from nearby drilling, nearby airplanes, things like that, um, might be enough to sort of disrupt the mom when she's setting up her den and force her to move and leave, which is super duper energy expensive, right? These bears are fasting pretty much the whole time they're denning till when they come out in the spring and, and start hunting again with their young cubs. So any extra energy or anything that disrupts them while denning is really one of the, the most critical or vulnerable times of the whole species, right? Because that's when, if we're not getting new cubs born into a stable environment, then the population starts to decline. So sound, even though you wouldn't think about it necessarily up in our Arctic, is actually one of the things that is really important to track as our world starts to change. So that's sort of our, one of the things that, that human sound can really play into. And other thing, all right, let's see if I can pull this off. So the other thing is the sounds that they would make to each other right so they're a pretty solitary species but that being said when they do get around each other sound is still one of the main ways to communicate and yes they do definitely have body language but hold my thing for a second we'll see if i can pull this off all right i think you know again we get used to seeing pictures uh of bears and so it's something else when you have a chance to tap into the sound of what they make, right? Because um, they're not always as expected, you know, they're not always these, these fierce creatures. Um. So comfy. I'll admit, I don't quite like the human voicing over of it, but these are the- It's cold. Mom. Vocalizations are so important when they're cubs. It's the, the earliest communication that kicks in from like the moment they're born. Where are Those are the sounds that they're using um, to indicate whether they're hungry, whether they're cold. Come back. And sound is what mom uses to indicate back. Love you. And this is, so most people wouldn't call this purring, they'd call it humming, and I'm going to come back to that one in a bit. Hello. That nervousness you see a lot in teenagers, they will vocalize more, and of course, aggression. Back off. All right. Um, yeah, right. Those sounds are there. Uh, it's just funny because humans, you know, one of our first things we do is we shout out and we reach, but the interesting thing is like for cubs, it makes sense that vocalizations would be their main wing because they don't ha they haven't developed body language yet, right? Bears are generally very quiet species. It's only once you push them to more of extreme emotions that those sounds come out. So it's kind of the same as people, right? Our, our little babies cry a lot because they're not able to communicate in the other ways that they want to, right? So grow up, if they grow up to be like me, they'll talk with their hands all the time. Um, but, oops, come on back now. Um, but those sounds are um, are a big part of, I guess, this like th that that family bonding, 
and then communication further out too. And so I don't know why I couldn't, I was trying to find one of the Berenstein books where they were doing musical things, but this was this, this one is what I'll do. But when they were talking about the bear humming, so I don't, it was a really quick clip in there and they, and they had it labeled as purring, but there's just one sound I just want to focus on for a second. Cause I think it's kind of amazing. So, um, when I was reading up on bears humming, I couldn't help but think of like Papa Bear humming as he was walking down the road, but I couldn't find the book that he did that. So this will be our, our, uh, our placekeeper while I go through this. But so bears are actually capable of humming. It's not purring like a cat would purr, um, but they are creating a vocalization sort of not so much necessarily in their chest, but it's kind of higher up, just like you and I would hum. If I hum, hmm, right, it's at the back of your throat and then the vibration is into your jaw. Um, and so humming is most observed actually in little cubs when they're nursing. And an interesting thing about it that they're both studying in bears, but people as well, is how sound affects hormone releases. So this is pretty cool, right? So the, the humming of the cub is thought to be one of the things that gets um, the mother to release more milk or release more um, because the humming in, uh, instigates a hormone release on her side. So that's that interaction. Paired with that interaction is that the humming, so physical humming, actually is also a self-soothing mechanism for the cub. So it's not just an expression of happiness, but the, the joy that creates the hum, actually then positive feedback creates more um, endorphins or hormones that are released in happiness. And so they see it in cubs, but they also see it in larger bears as well in moments of contentment is that they will hum. Um, and so for anyone out there who's, you know, music is your happy place, I hope you feel very justified that it is on a very base level that those physical vibrations are a big part of tying into happiness, even in the bear world. So it's a quick aside, but I, I thought it was one of the coolest sounds uh, to get to tie into. All right, I gotta keep us moving. So we have done sight, we have done hearing. Now the third one um, in our list then should be smell, right? So bears being solitary creatures, they really rely on their smell or olfaction for a lot of things. Um, and believe it or not, you know, they're really solitary creatures, or sorry, that's not the believe it or not part. They're really solitary creature. We know that in general, they pretty much only get together either when there's a resource need, um, you know, like whale carcasses, you know, cubs, um, mum raising her cubs, bears put together, mating time. But really, most of their lives, they are physically very separated from each other. And as humans, we have a notion to call them that being alone. But I hope that by the time we are done here today, you'll have a different perspective on what that really means. So if I go back to this picture that I had a sort of waiting on as we were opening up the webinar, um, this picture, how would you communicate here? Would you yell out for help? Or, you know, would you call someone over for supper? This doesn't really look like a place where sound is super useful, right? What about sight? Well, once you get closer to that horizon, you can't see five kilometers here because the, you know, you can't tell the difference where the sky ends and the land begins. So it doesn't seem like sight is super helpful. Maybe once, you've, once you know something to look for, then you can follow it with your eyes. But, but trying to find something in this landscape as soon as the wind picks up is pretty much a no-go. And so believe it or not, in a place like this, the best way to find your way or to find someone or something is by their smell. So us poor little humans, I, even, you know, my sister, she has an amazing sense of smell. I swear she can walk into the house and like find, you know, if I've forgotten a banana in the corner, she will find it. She has a crazy sense of smell, it blows my mind. Um, but us poor humans, we have really quite a pathetic sensory uh, sense of olfaction, their ability to smell our environment, right? So dogs, you know, we all we always compare to dogs. They're such, you know, bloodhounds being able to sense things out, you know, depending on the species of the, or the breed, excuse me, of the dog, they have anywhere from like 10,000 to 100,000 times better sense of smell than us because so much of their, um, you know, their brain is devoted to smelling. 
So what that means is like a bloodhound, they can find, so if you think about just like molecules in the air, if they're looking for a smell, one molecule in one trillion, that's what their nose is able to pick up, right? Now I'm gonna tell you that bears, and, specific, and definitely even polar bears, have a way better smell than even the best bloodhound you have ever come across, right? All the better to smell you with. So the nasal cavity, and, it, and it's all about because their bodies have, have sort of evolved and they've devoted their nerves into developing their sense of smell. So their nasal cavity um, is filled with these little labyrinths of very thin bones. And that's sort of the skeleton or the structure, the scaffolding, let's say, that holds what's called the epithelium, which are this thin layer of cells that are, all, that are filled with nerves. And so what happens is that when they breathe in, molecules interact with this really thin skin filled with nerves and it sends electrical signals information to the brain to be interpreted sorry just give me one sec and so for a bloodhound i said that they so a bloodhound right there the sense of smell is you know thousands of times better than ours but on average, bears have seven times better sense of smell than what the best bloodhound would. That's what a polar bear can smell. So if you think about that, that's one molecule that if they breathe it in out of seven trillion molecules. If there is one molecule in there that they're interested in, their brain can pick it up, right? And that's because they have a bigger nasal cavity, they have more nerves devoted to that information being sent to the brain, their olfactory bulb is processing it, right? They've just uh, they just evolved. Oh, here we go. So here, this is the um, this is the naval turbinates. But really, it's kind of like the you know like the radiator uh, in your car or the radiator in your house, right? It's like the more surface area you give something, the more it has a chance to interact. So when they're breathing in that cold air, it actually serves two functions for them, which is great. One is it they breathe in past all of these little cells to get as much smell and information as possible from it, and two. They also have a bigger space to heat up that air before it gets into their internal body. So think about it, most of the time for them, they're breathing in air that's, you know, uh, like minus 40 Celsius or, uh, or yeah, I guess minus 40 either way, right? Very cold or like minus 20, but it's very, very cold is what I'm saying. And so when you breathe that in, if that goes straight to your lungs, that can damage your lungs. So it's not only aiding in their ability to smell, but in their Arctic environment, it's a double blessing because that. Uh, it has to get warmed up past all of that, and then by the time it comes into their lungs, it's at a more reasonable temperature and doesn't harm their body. Right, so it's a it's a double win for them. So they it's this why so they've devoted all this effort into smelling, but they also have a few behavioral responses uh, that also increase their ability to smell. So one of them, which they share actually with lots of other mammals, is called the Flemin response. Have you ever seen if you have your pet or maybe a horse or someone like that, something like that? They do this kind of strange thing where they lift up their head, excuse me, and then they kind of lift up their lip and then they breathe in, but they're actually breathing in with their nose closed and they're breathing in. And what they're actually trying to do is they're trying to force air through these two tiny holes in the top of their mouth. Um, excuse me. And that's called the. <laughs> nasal. I always mess that one up, uh, organ. So what that is, is that they actually have a, an additional special organ in beside all of those really fine epithelium um, that they're using to interpret, usually it's pheromones. Usually they're interested in their own species and they're looking for information about what their own species is up to. That can be mating, that can be looking for community, can be a few different things. Um, but they're forcing air into that special organ which is um, it's kind of like the animal kingdom equivalent of doing a double take, right? right? So if they're looking for a, for a girlfriend or a boyfriend, they would follow those pheromones and they would be forcing them into that small cavity in order uh, to get even more information about it, right? So they, they already are rocking, you know, they're already able to pull out one molecule out of seven trillion, but then they even have a specialized organ on top of that, right? So if you ever do look at a bear skull, you can actually see those holes are there and that's what they're they're forcing that extra air up and into. Now humans, I don't know if you're happy or sad to hear this over there. We don't really have it anymore. There's uh, we've we've evolved away from it. We don't have nearly as much um, 
nerves devoted to our olfactory sense or to our sense of smell. There's a few people who might have a bit of it left over, but uh, or there's a uh, vestigial, you can have the air holes, but there's no connection anymore uh, in order to breathe through. So these are the organs. You kind of have an idea of how amazingly sensitive they are. Now the question comes, what are they breathing in? What are they looking for, right? So smells actually stay around for a lot longer than we realize, right? For us, we can't see a smell, right? Our nose can't smell it for us to make us help us follow it. You know, you're lucky if you come home and someone's made cookies, you can follow that smell, right? You can follow that smell straight to the oven, but we can't see it. So the best way to kind of visualize what smells are doing and how they hang about is thinking about smoke in the air or thinking about, you know, if you could, if you could color perfume, what would it do? What would it look like? Where would it move, right? It follows and flows with those air currents, which basically means that even though you and I don't realize it, every single one of us is just walking around with this flow of, uh, of information behind us, of this colored smoky trail that follows us everywhere we go, every step we take, right? And obviously how long it lingers has to do with our environment, right? So for a polar bear, right, I, you know, the Arctic is a very open place. It's very windy. Um, and so the factor of weather will kind of change how that trail forms and gets followed, right? So they've actually, it, it, it took a while, but they actually finally did get some evidence of, of watching polar bears hunt via smell, not seeing anything. Um, but what they do is, so one of the most successful means of hunting is actually crosswind hunting. So they're not looking, right? They're just basically walking crosswind. You've got the wind blowing across and they're walking perpendicular to it and they're just smelling. So imagine being able to take in 7 trillion cells and identify each one of them of interest and you're just breathing. All they need to do is breathe and walk. And as they do that, any trail of something interesting and yummy upwind of them is going to be able for them to pick them up. So to give an, an idea of that, seal um, polar bears are able to smell a seal at its breathing hole and this is not a, a seal that's done anything. It's just come up, taken a few breaths and gone back down at anywhere sort of from a three to five kilometer range downwind, right? So a couple miles away, they're able to just smell a seal that's kind of to breathe. It hasn't laid on the ice. It hasn't done anything. All it's done is taken a few breaths and then gone back down in the hole, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And also when you think about how seals sort of work and function, they have their density. We're going to stick with ring seals now. We're just going to focus on one prey because otherwise we get real convoluted if we go down that other rabbit hole. They are on average, there's about a, like maybe one seal for every square kilometer, right? That's if you would average the whole area. Obviously, there's areas that's really, really dense. And there's areas that there's not a lot. And that usually one or two might share a breathing hole, but they don't share more than that because then they get too dense and there are consequences to... Uh, to it. So what they'll do often is they'll keep more than one open and one or two will use it because they have to keep them open actively. That's nothing to keep in mind. They actually have claws and they have to scratch at them to make sure that they keep that breathing air, that breathing hole available to them. Otherwise they can suffocate because they're still a mammal. They need to be able to breathe that air. So in general they'll keep their breathing hole spaced about 200 meters apart um, and then polar bears what they'll do is they're walking across one and if they get scent of one then they start walking up one and they follow that trail, they follow those cookies to the oven, right? They're following that smell. And on the ring seal side of things, this is pretty much a game of cat and mouse that they've evolved over the millions of years that they've coexisted, um, such to the point that seals are very, very uh, head shy creatures. One is that they don't really like to haul out, but if they do, they always make sure that they're facing downwind. So that polar bear who was walking crosswind and is now following their scent is going to be downwind of them. So anytime you see a seal haul out of the water, you look at its face, that can tell you what direction the wind is flowing or the wind is going, excuse me. They also very, very rarely ever get more than a, like a body length away from the edge of their hole because they are very slow, right? They have fused hips. They pretty much have to do the worm to get back into the water. And so a polar bear will run and charge and it's this race event for who can, whether it can get back into the hole beforehand. Now, like I said, that it only takes a few breaths for a polar bear to have enough molecules for them to find them, 
and you're going to be wondering, well, where is that smell coming from? Well, it comes from many different places. But most mammals, including us, although we are not nearly as conscious of it, I would say, as many other animals, have uh, scent glands in different parts of their bodies. So seals, like a lot of other animals, like cats, have scent glands in their face and along their cheeks, right? And those are oil-based, right? So oil-based things reside, can stay in their environment for a lot longer than most other uh, than anything water-based, right? They'll really stick around. And so what that means is that those are, even for you and I, we have all these hormones that get excreted from our cells, especially when we sweat, right? So when we sweat, and, you know, when sweat comes off, that's where all that oil builds up from. And mammals have been using that as a means of communication um, nearly pretty much since their existence. So for most bears, when they also have scent glands on their body, right? If we shift over from thinking about this from predatory and sort of uh, within the species communication, they're not only interested in the sweat of the other animals, but they're interested in the sweat of their own. So if you ever see a bear rubbing up on a tree, like big old blue, part of it is yes, maybe they do want a back scratch, but more likely they actually have scent glands on the back shoulders. And what they're doing is they're like a poster board. They're basically leaving information behind for the next bear to say, who is here? Who stopped by? How long ago were they here? Right? Were they male? Were they female? Were they young? Were they old? They might even be able to identify down to sort of individual level. We haven't been able to figure that part out yet. But if you think about our polar bear friend, they don't have a nice tree to scratch on or a, or, or a big boulder even to leave a note behind on. They pretty much only have the sea ice the majority of the time. So what that means is that they rely a lot more predominantly on the sweat glands between their toes. So they actually have, and just like you and I do, right? Our hands, you get nervous, you get sweaty. We've got lots of sweat glands here. Well, in between polar bear toes, they actually have special glands that release pheromones, and those can last in their paws. Well, they haven't actually done a study for polar bears, but they did it for pandas, and it was like more than 60 days. So think about that. If you walked by here a couple months ago, you've still left information about who you were for someone else to read months later, which is pretty darn amazing. And so other bears will come along and smell the footprints to see who's there and if they're interested in them let's say if it's a male who is suddenly interested in following a female he will get cheeky and he will step exactly over her paw prints in order to mask her scent with his which is pretty crazy all right how am i doing on time here i'm gonna do a quick nod we've covered the big three i would say i'm gonna have a quick nod to touch and taste and we'll wrap it up there. So, just like you and I, right, polar bears, their ability to touch um, as a mammal is made up in what's called a Merkel cell. It's what looks like that little squid blue thing at the top. So all of our cells, we have them, um, but obviously we have them in different densities, right? So kind of just like us, most of theirs are accumulated in their paws and around their face, right? Um, but, they also, in most mammals, would have whiskers, right? And those whiskers would have a lot of those cells around them. Now, really interesting thing in polar bears is that they've actually sort of de-evolved their whiskers. They've given up on that sense of touch around their face, or they have prioritized it less compared to, say, a brown bear or a black bear or even just any other carnivore, really. So they're no longer interested in that as a, or it's not a helpful form of information or signals from the get. And if you think about why, it has to do with their Arctic environment, right? So for them, when they're breathing in and out, the whiskers would often just get covered in frost, right? And so that would then always stimulate those cells of this if they're being touched. And so it was not a helpful thing to keep in the Arctic, which is true, actually, if you look at a lot of Arctic species, right? They really shorten up all of those things because they're not helpful. Another just quick cool aside is that those whisker spots, so that's what that picture is of on the right, the little black dots that line up. So even though they've de-evolved the actual hairs themselves, they still have the little like freckles on their face of where those hairs would grow. And in the same way that you can identify a like a humpback whale by its fluke and the unique pattern, they're actually starting to identify polar bears by the unique pattern of their whiskers, which is pretty freaking cool. All right, I said I would get to it quickly. Do polar bears actually like Coca-Cola? will be a fast track run. Uh, the short answer is, I don't know, but I can speculate. So we actually have not done very many taste studies about polar bears and what type of 
foods they do enjoy. But we've uh, but there has been a lot of work done on pandas, so we're going to use that as a parallel. So first, uh, so pandas have actually hyper evolved the ability for sweetness and for bitterness, right? If you think about the five senses, you've got sweet, salty, uh, sour, bitter, and umami. And so um, they've lost sort of the like um, meat flavors, like the umami flavor, that is not in a, in a panda's palate, but they have a heightened sense of bitter and sweet. And we think that has to do with the bitter one being a reflection of their diet bending to when bamboo shoots are young or old and when to transition their diet from feeding on one part to the other which is pretty cool. So when we think about that then for bears, so, and then the other comparison is to make to a lot of marine mammals. So most whales, seals, things like that, they de-evolve the ability to taste anything sweet. So that means that if we think about the palate of a panda and the palate of a polar bear, most likely the palate of the polar bear is shifted in the same direction as marine mammals, which means they're not interested in sweet things. So they're still probably able to taste things that are savory and that having being a pole or a preferred taste. So I hate to say it, but based on that evidence alone, it's probably unlikely that polar bears would actually like to drink Coca-Cola because they're not a big fan of sugary things. Even though they've, yeah, they've stepped away from other bears, they're not interested in the berries as much either. But either way, if anyone ever chooses to do the study or maybe Coca-Cola will counteract that and do the study themselves and find out, please let me know. And with that, I hope you have enjoyed uh, trying to sense the world or understand maybe how a polar bear can sense their world around them and how that's so very different from us. And with the time, I will pass it back to Rob. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we get into the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So do bears, other bears have similar eyes to that of the polar bears? Mm hmm. Yeah, so most, um, yeah, so we have eight species of bears that are still extant or still living, and most of them would have similar ranges of vision. Um, there is some potential shifts, maybe for like a bit of the like the color to differentiate, because you do have ones like sun bears, sloth bears, spectacle bears that are relying a lot more on fruit. So there is the potential that they could have, that their eyes are, have selected more for color differentiation. Um, but in general, they'd still be dichromatic. So they still would only have those, those red, blue phases, uh, cones or wavelengths that they're able to see. Great, thank you. So what about sense of smell? Do they have a more defined sense of smell than other bears do? So yeah, so polar bears, relative to the size of their, like, brain and head have the largest amount of nerves dedicated to olfaction so to smelling so obviously again it could be different maybe slightly bear to bear but just in general their species is more heightened for smell they're they're more reliant on it to, to navigate their whole life gotcha thanks so one of our guests noticed in their polar bear pictures that uh, the polar bears have their tongue sticking out is that some sort of sensory thing for the bears as well yeah, I'd be curious about when the photo is and there's a few other things, but yes, there there are some benefits to that, right? So you can think about um, even you and I, right? We can taste and smell things the same way and you'll see dogs sometimes even do it too, but it's about getting more information in, um, either yeah, via the tongue or just deeper breaths um, or at the same time. Um, the only other thing I would think about would be wondering what time of year it was and how hot they were. So it's like a side funny thing, but it also, there's not a lot of places, um, bears are like dogs in that way. So as far as expelling heat, they actually really can only lose, they're so well insulated, which is great for the winter time, but it's really bad for, for warmer seasons. So if that is happen to be, even when you see them, they can only sweat from their paws and actually their mouth and sort of around their face is where they can lose heat from. Um, so if you were say like for me, I'll be in Churchill here in October, those bears are very hot. So that can be one of the heat responses. So can polar bears uh, smell these scents if they're if the air is calm and it's and the smell is really far away? I mean, do we know how far away they can smell things from? Yeah. Okay. So I was head shy to put in some numbers on this because some of them are not. Or it's like, um, there are stories of like personal. Well, these are personal accounts and not stories as in made up, but but personal accounts of a bear turning direction at more than like 20, 30 kilometers away being able to smell something upwind, right? So obviously it depends on how much wind you have, the source of the smell, 
uh, how consistent the wind pattern is. The other thing to think about though is that if it's not windy, it also means that that smell doesn't go anywhere, right? So as long as the whatever the molecules are, if they don't degrade, they just stay concentrated. So they actually just sort of settle in the air. So even on non-windy days, there's still lots of information for them to have there. It's just not spread across the same amount of distance. Um, so the reality is that they like probably a whale. So imagine like a whale carcass on a windy day. I would not be surprised if they could smell it from like 20, 40 miles away. Like that wouldn't, I wouldn't even bat an eye at that, right? Because you have such a like high source of, of molecules, strong wind, right? And that's how like lots of like, you know, bears will congregate around a whale carcass and it doesn't take them long to get there, right? So pretty much any bear in the area, if one washes up, they are all like on it. Do uh, polar bears in captivity, like in zoos, do they lose some of their senses? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. Um, most likely, no, right? Um, it's not going to be like a use it, you lose, or you lose it, you, <laughs> you don't use it, you lose it thing. Um, I think what comes to my mind is that biologically, they're still the same, but what they associate smells with would change very, very differently. Right, so a um, like a captive bear may or may not, if they're born in captivity, for example, and they never never in the wild, right? Their reaction to like the smell of a seal may or may not be the same as it is to one in the wild. Some of it might still be there, but um, right, or there's you know the idea of different smells that they would encounter and what they would get normalized to, right? That's another big one of thinking about, you know, if if all of these colors represent the things that they could smell you know the intensity of them what they get used to what they don't get used to right your world would be very very different if you're always really stimulated versus uh if you have a very calm environment so that you would always pick up on the like the slightest change right so i don't know i wish we could ask them do we know how fast these polar bears can run that's a good question uh so on average it's about Oh, I, haven't done, I think it's on my head, about 35 miles an hour, faster than I can and about faster than you can. But they're sprinters. So odds are you wouldn't be able to outrun them, but they rarely run for more than a kilometer or two because it's just such a high energy expenditure. It's not within their, uh, it's it's not worth it for them. They're, they're normally like sprinters on the scale of, you know, maybe a hundred meters or a few hundred feet kind of thing. Great, thanks for addressing that. Uh, unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have for today. So I'm going to throw it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us. Thank you, everyone, for joining in today. It was uh, it was a pleasure to take the time to view the world through through another senses. I hope you also enjoyed that as well. Take care. I've got one more webinar webinar before Churchill comes. So probably do one more thing on some polar bears. If you want to make any suggestions, feel free to leave one in the comments. Um, but otherwise, take care and yeah, please enjoy um, whatever the day unfolds for you. Christina, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you could travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.